Welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games, where we feed our people with relatable content, and our victory condition is your satisfaction. I'm Harry, and today we have another playthrough and review. Today I'm going to be playing through and reviewing this game right here, Altera, Age of Exploration. Full disclaimer, this is a paid playthrough and review. Another disclaimer, all the pieces, components that you will see in this game are all in prototype form, so keep that in mind. Altera here is a tabletop RPG that is a role-playing game, and as a matter of fact, it's the first pure RPG that we'll be covering here at When Harry Met Board Games. So this is... Pretty much what Altera Age of Exploration looks like. As I mentioned, keep in mind that all the components you see here are in prototype form. These little miniatures here are my own. I gather them from different games that I have in my own collection. And as with any kind of tabletop role-playing game, players can either choose to use some sort of tangible representation of the world that they are exploring, that they're embarking. Or they can just choose to use uh, what people refer to as the theater of the mind. They don't need, need to actually have a tangible representation or a board or a grid or anything like that. Instead, players can just simply use their imagination. Because as with all role-playing games, the goal is not necessarily about accomplishing things or winning or victory. Truth be told, the goal is the experience, the storytelling, the collaboration between uh, players and the game master, or as this game refers to it, the storyteller, in trying to tell a longer, broader narrative. Now, one major difference between Altera and other traditional role-playing games is character creation. The typical RPG has character sheets where players pencil in different numbers and stats that will determine how good or how efficient, proficient they might be at particular skills. In Altera here, the character creation is done through the selection of different cards. So, first of all, each player is going to choose a spell school, which is associated with one of the elements. So, for example, this player here is going to have the ice spell school, and they will grab two combat spells and two cantrip spells in their respective spell school. So, for example, they'll have this player here, the cold down spell here, which has a range of six, and it says one enemy within six spaces takes d6 damage this turn, two d6s at the start of your next turn, and three d6s on the turn after that. We have this snow manifestation here. It says one enemy within four spaces takes d6 damage and is frozen, which means they cannot take damage, attack, or move until the start of your next turn. Then we have these two cantrip spells here. We have Ice Shield. Create a shield of ice protecting you or another player. It lasts one turn or until it blocks one magic or weapon attack. And finally, we have the Frostify here, which... uh is another cantrip spell. It says, freeze one small thing solid or make the ground in one space slick with ice for one round. So again, each player gets the cards in their respective spell school. This player here will take the earth spell school and this player here to the far right will take the nature spell school. On top of choosing a spell school, each player is going to choose a primary weapon. So this player over here is going to take their hammer here, which deals five damage when it successfully attacks and it's mainly attack and it needs a roll of 10 on a d20 in order to hit and it has this knockback ability on a hit you push the target one space away from you so it creates distance this player here is going to have their axe as the primary weapon and again this is a melee attack this deals six damage again you need a 10 to hit on a d20 and it has a special ability vicious it attacks critically hit on rolls of 19 or 20, because in this game, typically a D20, a, a natural roll of 20, is a critical hit, and it deals twice as much damage. But for this axe here, a 19 will also be treated as a critical hit. And then finally, this player here on the right has the long sword as their primary weapon. It deals 5 damage, again, a melee attack, and a 10 or higher to hit on a roll of D20. And it has this cleave ability. You may attack two enemies if they are next to each other, and, of course, next to you, because it's a melee weapon. So, on top of having their spell schools and their primary weapons, the players will each also choose an offhand item. And this player here is going to choose the long bow. It has a range attack. Uh, it deals 4 damage. And it needs a 10 or higher in order to hit. Uh, it has this drawback ability. You may move before or after attacking, but not both. 
Uh, it's a two-handed weapon, so you cannot use a shield when you have this. So players that have an offhand weapon will spend the game alternating their offhand item, perhaps with their primary item, depending on whether or not they have enough hands to wield both. Here we have a short bow as the offhand item for this player here. And it says here, range attack, uh, range 10 attack. It takes a 10 to hit. Uh, 10 or higher and it's again two-handed so you may not use a shield when you have a short bow and finally this player here is going to have their shield here as their offhand item it reduces damage taken by melee attacks by one uh, this can reduce it all the way to zero it cannot be used if you have a two-handed weapon now at the beginning of the game, each player has a starting amount of hit points, and the hit points are the amount of health that they have, their life if you will, that's how much damage they could sustain throughout the game, through combat, before they are knocked out or exhausted. And at the beginning of each game, each player's starting hit points is 10. Now at the beginning of the game, each player's character has a starting speed of 5, and 5 indicates how many spaces a player can move on their turn, because every player's turn is divided into two actions. First of all, a movement up to their speed which again each player starts with a uh, speed of five and for movement you can move diagonally if you so please after your movement you can take another type of action now this can quite often result in an action of attack you're engaging in combat with some enemy but there's other types of actions that you could take throughout the game now a player could always choose to forfeit their primary action in order to move double the amount of their speed. So for example, if you really want to cover lots of ground and move 10 spaces in one shot, you would just do nothing else on that turn. Now anything beyond your basic typical movement, let's say for example you're trying to traverse some adverse terrain features or maybe swim across a body of water, climb up a mountain, any space uh, that requires uh, that type of difficulty or challenging movement would actually take two speed points for each of those spaces instead of the typical one speed point for each space you cover. Now one particularly unique feature of this game that deviates from the traditional mold of RPGs, uh, historically speaking, is that when a player wants to perform a certain task that would normally require a skill check, there are no skill checks in this game. The player simply verbalizes that he or she wants to attempt to perform this task and the storyteller will use his or her judgment to determine whether or not that task is feasible within the world that they are in. So if the storyteller deems that that task is within the realm of possibility, then the player will successfully complete that task. Now, in certain situations, when the storyteller feels that the player is uh, under pressure or under duress, uh, under adverse circumstances, then the storyteller can tell the player to roll a d20 to indicate the measure of success that the player will have with this skill or with this task. Again, there is no failure in performing this task, but depending on their role of a d20 will determine if they had some negative consequences even though they succeeded at this task, or if they just succeeded at it regularly, or if they uh, surpassed everybody's expectations and went over and beyond success as far as performing that task. Now as far as actually playing Altera, as with many role-playing games, players can choose to craft and create their own adventures, their own quests, weave them into longer campaigns. However, the prototype here that I have does come with an introductory adventure and it's called the Kimona Magic Contest. And here in chapter one of this adventure, it says the Shining Sea. Players have set out in search of Kimona, the Sky Tree, in order to enter a magic tournament held there annually. The prize for winning is a Staff of the Phoenix, which you can find the card for in your treasure deck. The, tr the characters are all promising young mages eager for a chance at fame and fortune. Yet today, they have little money, not even enough to make the journey. So they found a ship traveling to their destination and convinced a merchant trader to hire them. Now, the adventure comes with some special notes for the storyteller or the game master in these blue uh, text boxes here. And it also comes with some narrative for them to read. It says, you find yourself on a cargo ship bound for the city of Blueport. You've decided this year that you'll participate in the Kimona 
Magic Contest, an annual tournament where up-and-coming mages compete to show off their skills for a grand prize. Characters don't necessarily know each other, but you're quickly acquainted on board as you travel to Bridgeport. Your passage was paid by a Tanuki merchant named Bando, who is dealing in fine rugs, silk tapestries, and other artwork. Tanuki are famously bad at lines, so when he said you should come along to keep me company, we definitely won't be attacked by dragons, krakens, or sea serpents, so this whole trip will be so dull. I'll need some friends to talk to. Brunthill is just a day's ride in from Blueport, and Kimona is another day's travel beyond that. They will earn a fair rate of one 100 coins each, which you can use to pay the contest entry fee of 50 coins and still have a bit to spare. While on the ship, you're expected to work such as cleaning, cooking, and acting a lookout. And it gives a little bit more of a description of the NPC here, Bando. And then finally here, we have the introduction of the dragon. This uh, adventure here actually wastes no time introducing us to a foe, to an enemy. It says, late in the afternoon, a lookout spots a huge winged shape uh, on the horizon. It approaches the ship 150 feet above the water, then dives towards the boat, breathing blue fire and raining spell down spells. The ship is being attacked by a dragon. The ship captain uh, remains at the helm, controlling the ship's direction, but warns you, don't try jumping overboard to escape a blue dragon's flames. Their blue fire won't be extinguished by seawater and will float on top of the ocean and continue burning for several minutes. So we have this young uh, blue dragon. It has a large size, which means it takes up to four spaces on the grid here and it tells us here the instructions to place the dragon uh, next to one of the players on the deck of the ship so I'm just going to place it right here on the deck of the ship and the young dragon is going to immediately according to the instructions here start by attacking it's going to use its splash down ability which is one of its potential uh, attack abilities here it's a cantrip spell on the player uh, furthest from her. And it attempts to bite the player she is next to. So that's another one of its attacks. That player rolls a d20 to dodge the bite and does so if they roll a 10 or higher. So first of all, she's going to do the cantrip uh, spell, a splashdown to the player furthest from her. Which would be this player here all the way in the back. And according to the Splashdown Cantrip, so it has a range of 10 and it does a D4 damage. Now, very important, let me explain a little bit about combat. Typically in combat, what's going to happen is the enemies are always going to attack first. And here it's going to specify how many times the enemy attacks per turn uh, according to the player count. So here, I'm simulating three players here. And for a three player count, the dragon, first of all, has a life or hit points of 40. So you're going to have to knock him down 40 in order to defeat her and it has two attacks per turn when there's three players in the game now after the dragon does her attack each player in clockwise order will be able to perform one of their attack actions then during the second round of combat players will actually attack in counter clockwise order now, because the blue dragon here, I should have grabbed the blue dragon instead of the red one here. Because the blue dragon here is attacking with a spell, the splashdown is a cantrip spell. A spell is always an automatic hit. When you attack an enemy with a weapon, you have to roll d20s in order to indicate whether or not that attack was successful. But spells are always automatically successful. They always automatically hit their opponents. However, you do have to roll the indicated die in order to determine the damage. So according to this, we roll a d Four and determine the damage. So I rolled a four with a d4, which is the highest you could roll. So that would deal four damage to the player right here. Now this player here does have the shield, which reduces their damage taken from melee by one. So instead, they'll only sustain three damage. So their 10 hit points would be lowered to three. Now, according to the instructions, the blue dragon is also going to do a bite to their nearest target. And they have two targets that are equally uh, close to them. So the storyteller will choose which player will be the target for the attack. And we'll just choose this player right here. And they're going to do their bite attack, which is a melee attack. And as with all physical attacks, there is a question as to whether or not it will succeed. Again, spells, magic spells, will always automatically succeed. And you will only roll dice in order to determine the damage. However, with 
uh, melee attacks or physical attacks of any kind, you have a predetermined damage. In this case, for the bite, it will be four damage. However, there is a question as to whether or not it succeeds. Now, unlike your typical traditional ro role-playing games, instead of the players, uh, or the DM, I should say, the storyteller or the game master, the dungeon master, rolling to determine whether or not the enemies are successful in their attacks, instead, what's going to happen is the player is actually going to roll to determine the success and they're rolling to dodge and if it's a ranged uh, attack then if they succeed in their attempt to dodge they will simply sidestep move one step to the side and avoid that attack however if it's a melee attack then instead they are going to counter attack if they are successful in that roll so we will roll the d20 and on a roll of 10 or higher the player successfully dodges that attack. However, I rolled a two here, which means I was not successful at dodging that attack. And instead, the uh, dragon here is going to hit this player and deal them four damage because that's what the bite does. Now the dragon is done with their first round of combat. And again, in turn order, each player would take a crack at trying to attack and hit the dragon. So let's just say that this player here would want to attack by using their hammer, which is a melee weapon, therefore they have to be next to their opponent, and they are, and they would roll a d20, and on a hit of 10 or higher, they would succeed, and I roll an 11, therefore they are successful. And this would deal 10, uh, 5 damage, I should say, to the dragon. So the dragon who starts with a hit point of 40 would be knocked down to 35. Now also, because it has the knockback ability on a hit, you would push the target one space away from you so now the target is a little bit further away and the players would have to move in order to get closer uh, or in range uh, or in melee range for this enemy and this would continue until the dragon or the players are knocked down to zero hit points if all the players are knocked down to zero hit points after a combat encounter, then the storyteller would have to determine what's the aftermath. However, if an enemy is ever knocked down to zero hit points, then that enemy will flee. And this is pretty much how you play Altera, Age of Exploration. This is obviously a very open-ended, narrative-driven, storytelling, role-playing game that could last many hours, sessions upon sessions of gameplay. So for the purposes of this video, we're going to call it quits right now, and we're going to get back and hear my final thoughts and grades. Now, what are my final thoughts about Altera, Age of Exploration? First of all, I'd like to say that this game absolutely accomplishes what it sought out to accomplish, which is to be a gateway into tabletop role-playing games. This game, I think, is a marvelous introduction into the tabletop role-playing world, especially, I would say, for a board gamer entering that world. Now, I, for example, am not really a role player. I do happen to subscribe to lots of YouTube channels that cover uh, role playing games, D and D, and such. And I am a big fan of RPG like board games. But coming from that perspective, I can appreciate how Altera here has simplified and altered some of the typical infrastructure of a tabletop role playing game. Uh, and again, made it more. Uh, accessible to a novice or to a board gamer trying to explore uh, that world, Age of Exploration. Uh, now, I will say I appreciate lots of the deviations from the typical uh, role-playing rules, especially in their terminology. For example, referring to the Dungeon Master as Storyteller. I think that accomplishes the goal of telling the player this is what this player's uh, job is to do. They are here to navigate and direct the story. Uh, I like the fact that for the character creation, instead of having a character sheet and a bunch of uh, rolling of dice and penciling in numbers and doing mathematics and all sorts of formulas. Uh, it, it simplifies it and also makes it tangible because you do it through the drafting of these different cards that first of all determine your spell school. It determines what your primary weapons will be and some other item or object that you'll have offhand. And all these things make you different from all the players around the table, but they are tangible reminders in front of you in visual form with some artwork, uh, with some icons to remind you which dice you roll to activate these uh, cards with some uh, written texts that explain exactly 
what those cards do. Again, for a player entering this world and staring at a long, cumbersome list of skills and attributes and stats uh, and different modifiers and all this stuff. Again, it could be very, it could be very confusing and um, a task that they might not exactly look forward to. However, this is a good way to ease them into that character creation. I also appreciate the difference as far as the attacks instead of the dungeon master uh controlling the rolling of the enemies instead the players feel like they have a say so they get to roll a dodge attempt and if they succeed if they roll a 10 or higher they evade that attack and do not suffer its consequences and again it puts the control into the into the hands of the players and I think that's really what it's all about. A good dungeon master wants to tell a good story, wants the players to be immersed and engaged in their world. And what better way to do it than to allow them to control the role for all actions. I also like the fact that there are no skill tests uh, or skill checks that take place. Instead, when a player wants to perform a particular task, they simply need to utter it. And the dungeon master or the storyteller, I should say, would uh, determine whether or not it's possible or whether or not it can be done. And if it can, it will be done. And again, if it's a more challenging feat or perhaps the circumstances surrounding the task are adverse or there's some sort of challenges or pressure on the player, then in that case, they do roll a d20 and determine the measure of success. Did they just barely meet their, their, their expectation or they did... Uh, exceed their expectation or did they succeed but at the same time have some casualties some consequences because they were barely successful at it again i think that's all really cool really neat and uh works very well i am interested in seeing what the finalized production of this game looks like the prototype pieces get the job done but with this style of game the components and pieces don't necessarily mean so much because again for lots of people coming from this role-playing background this role-playing world uh the pieces are irrelevant because lots of people like to play within the theater of their mind that is totally in their imagination devoid of any tangible or physical objects however i do think as a gateway game for non uh, RPG players and in particular for board gamers coming into that world I do think that the value or the quality of their components can be a key determining factor as to whether or not it's successful in its conversion of board gamers into the role-playing world but other than that I think that this game gets the job done if you are interested in light uh, gateway style role playing games or perhaps you're interested in getting into role playing games and are wondering what kind of game uh, would suit you in that regard then Altera Age of Exploration is definitely a game you want to check out. Check in the description down below for a link to their website and more information on this game. That's it for today. This is Harry saying take care everybody, stay safe, stay healthy and have fun gaming. Bye bye.